We'd like to welcome you to the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. I'm your host, Amber, and I'm here with co-host Austin, and we'd like to know, do you have a passion to make a greater global impact? Are you ready to embrace leading with heart and love? If so, join us on this journey to become heart leaders who change the world. Each episode brings heart-centered connection, building stronger relationships, communities, and businesses. Let's take a deeper dive into what it means to be heart leaders. The Heart Leader Podcast starts now. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast. I'm co-host Austin Ewell, and today I'm here with someone amazing and special, my dear, dear friend, Akshay Nanavati. And I'm so excited to introduce you guys to Akshay today. Um, One, because he is definitely one of the most unique individuals I have ever met, Um, but he's also one of the deepest and I, we've had such incredible conversations just diving into spirituality and understanding self. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know him and his incredible, incredible journey. Uh, and I mean, he's been amazing just what you've gone through. I mean, you've literally lived all over the world. He's overcome uh, PTSD from being in war in Iraq as a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, Absolutely. right? <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, uh, everything from alcoholism, depression, being on the brink of suicide. And now he is a world-known uh, author, uh, speaker. In fact, his book, Fearvana, which is amazing, by the way, uh, has been endorsed by the Dalai Lama himself and uh, wrote the foreword. And it was incredible. Cool. And he has built just incredible, incredible uh, global business, um, while he's also just traversing the world and making suffering look easy. <laughs> so I'm so excited to just kind of dive in today and uh, and welcome you, my dear friend. Thank so we can kind of dive into empathy. And we've had some long discussions about love and about just kind of the spectrum of love and how fear and anxiety and stress kind of are on one side. But, you know, this whole, the whole spectrum itself is this beautiful experience of love that we get to um, dive into at all levels. Mm -hmm. And so with empathy today, I'm so excited to kind of dive in what empathy means uh, for self. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, as we were kind of just talking a little bit early and I appreciated that time that we got to like connect and chat and you're sharing something about, you know, empathy, you know, someone who is very empathetic and compassionate to all the people around you, you know, what is, what did that kind of start, you know, diving into for you? Like what was so, when we talked about that, you know, well, I love this frame of empathy of the self because until you brought that up, I didn't really think about it in that way to your, to your point about empathy for others, you know, that has built over this lifetime of experience on the edge. You know, I've been very blessed, I would say to have experienced humanity at its extremes, both without and within, you know, I've seen, I've volunteered in leper colonies, seen extreme poverty, worked with survivors of sex trafficking, Mm -hmm. uh, been to a war zone, you know, and seen, um, or worked with former child soldiers. And when you see the darkness of the human condition and what we are capable, the horrific things we are capable of doing to each other, it can't help touch your human human soul. Mm -hmm. You know, It, 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 it stays with you. It lives with you. And uh, that's part of the reason, some of the reasons why I struggled when came back from the war, you know, because I've always felt like the, and this is where you have, to, you have to find your line as you balance on this spectrum of navigating empathy for others, because if you go too far into the darkness, you're going to be consumed by it. Mm. You know, there's a quote from Nietzsche that beware who sta- he who stares into the abyss into the abyss because the abyss will stare back or something along those lines the abyss will yeah. consume you and so you have to navigate that because that for a long time i felt always guilty about this life that i've been blessed to live mm. you know when you see human suffering and you empathize with it you you i wouldn't say it's inevitable you empathize, empathize with it because there's a lot of people who see human suffering and then simply act on that like commit more suffering mm. you know put others in that hell but for us, like if you come from that place of love, when when love's what lives within you, you empathize with it, and it stays into in in, in your soul, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I've always wrestled with that guilt of why do I get this life when so many others don't? 
and I've it's not it's a question I have no answer to, but it's a question that I had even when I like did the darkness retreat. You know, as you know, I've done yeah. seven days in darkness and then ten days in darkness, two separate times. And a big theme for both those experiences was the wrestling with this guilt about my place on this earth. Mm. You know, wrestling with the fact that I mean, I when I was in Iraq, my vehicle drove over an active bomb and it didn't explode. Wow. I've almost been killed by falling boulders in the Himalayas while glacier caving. I've been, I mean, I've done a lot of dumb things in my childhood. Before joining the Marines, I was very heavily into drugs, lost two friends to addiction, was going down that path. And so when I look at all this, like, and I had a friend who his vehicle drove over a bomb and it did explode and he died. Wow. Why do I get to survive that? Why not him? Such a natural question. Right? Yeah. And so I've wrestled with that to the point that I had no answers to. I mean, even, you know, one, one thing that showed up regularly when, when I was in the darkness too, I did a 167 mile run across Liberia. It was about a marathon a day for a week, um, running across the country and we were raising funds to help build a school out there. Mm. And we did, it was amazing. I mean, profound experience personally and spiritually, but also just the impact we were able to make raising thousands of dollars to build a school. But on the first day of the run, these two kids were running next to me, Blessing and Emmanuel were their names. Mm. And one of the kids wanted to go to medical school. The other wanted to go to vocational training school. And the odds of that happening were damn near zero. One kid had lost his uh, mother in the war and his father left and he was staying with the other kid in this village in Liberia. And I remember running after that and just thinking, why, what separates me from them? Why do I, I mean, just because I was born to good parents in India, I automatically have a million times more opportunities than those two kids. And only because they were born where they're born. I didn't do a damn thing to earn that. And mm. I've always struggled with that. Mm. And that's where like that, so I, long winded way, I guess, of saying that empathy for others is, um, it makes you want to do something about it. You know, mm -hmm. like that's my whole work is helping guide people through suffering, you know, bringing light into where there's darkness. Mm -hmm. That's everything I do in Fear of Anna. And uh, it's, it's also had a hard impact on empathy for the self. So I can be quite hard on myself, uh, harder on myself than I would be on any other human being, <laughs> as you well know, you know, so which we can dive into. But yeah, just mm -hmm. that. It's been a journey navigating that and trying to figure out that and how to at least come to peace with it because I realize that I'll never be able to answer that question of why me, yeah. you know, why do I get this? There's some bigger force at play that I have no idea to, but what I can do is at least make something meaningful of this life that I have now been gifted mm -hmm. and do something good with it. That's beautiful, man. What, what is the difficulty when, when kind of shifting empathy towards yourself instead of others? Like, mm -hmm. Like, what are some of the things that are, are, what are a struggle for you? Like, what do you suffer with in that? Yeah. You know, I think part of it is that I feel like I haven't done enough to earn my place on this planet. Okay. Yeah. When I came back from the war, as I said, I lost a friend in the war. I, like, why do I, I didn't get shot. I didn't lose a limb. I didn't, you know, obviously die out there. Mm. Uh, why do I get this? Mm. And when you hold on to that, it doesn't create much room for love for the self because you're constantly upset that, you know, like you're, you're angry at yourself. You're, you don't, you don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy of life, mm. you know? Um, and, and that's been a challenge. Like, I think there's times, I mean, so for example, when I did this 10 day darkness retreat, it was just a few weeks ago. Yeah. I had this moment, if you want me to share, I'm happy to please, share. Like, yes, was, please. So it was on day five of the darkness retreat and I was, I couldn't sleep because what's, what happens is you start seeing lights, lights that are as real as anything else, right? Any of these lights. And they're very real. Like they say their brain starts to release DMT, which is one of the primary ingredients in ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. So you're experiencing these hallucinogenic lights. And I couldn't sleep because when your eyes are closed, you're still seeing lights. So imagine having transparent eyelids can't sleep there's still stimuli for everyone kind of listening this darkness like you're in complete darkness oh so right? sorry yeah to yeah. give context yeah it was 10 days of complete darkness and wow. isolation 24 hours a day you could not see your hand in front of your darkness complete darkness wow. yeah so yeah. you're in in this level in that level of darkness you're that's what happens they say your brain starts to release dmt and both times from the mm -hmm. seven day one as well as the 10 day one i experienced these light shows that were profound Amazing. you know and so on day five i couldn't sleep i sat up and i was just sat up and started meditating on my bed and then kind of met, you know, cross-legged. And I said, God, I surrender to you. Mm. And I don't remember exactly how this journey started and God knows how long it was. Cause obviously I had no sense of time. Right. Yeah. But uh, the first thing I remember is seeing this arrow in the lights and it was kind of pointing here. And I said, where are you taking me? Mm. And this voice said, don't worry, just follow. Mm. 
and I saw this kind of like white cylindrical shape in front of me, and I was like, what am I supposed to see? And it said, look deeper, look harder. And then I see this light kind of leading up here, and my head's going like this to the right. And up here, I see this kind of ball of light, and above it, I see like there was depth to darkness, like stars in the universe. It looked like a night sky. And I hear the voice said, I am everywhere. Hmm. And then this light burst and these green light crystals started falling. And this sounds surreal, but this is like, it was as real to me as seeing yeah. you in front of me, right? Love it. These green light crystals started falling. And as it burst into green, this, vo this voice said, I am in life. I am every, I am life. I am in everything. Hmm. And then it kind of faded out here. And as it did, it, it dissipated and it said, I am with you now go. And as soon as I heard that, I, I kind of broke out of the stupor and I just started bawling. Oh. The intensity of this, I just started bawling, you know? And then I started thinking about all these things that we're talking about. Like, you know, my mom's always told me from a young age, you have a hotline with God. And then I think about all these times that I should have died and I didn't. And, and I started thinking about these, you know, like as we speak right now, man, there's people who are, you know, who are being raped 40 times a day. There's mm. people in hell on earth in war zones and refugee camps. And I was thinking about that sitting there, like as I was in there, there's people just in hell. I got to choose to be in darkness. That's a luxury. That's a privilege to have to get to spend money to go for 10 days in darkness. Yeah. Most people don't get to choose their darkness. And I just thinking about like, why me? Why do I get this? And then I heard the voice start talking to me again and said, you know why? I said, I don't know why, you know, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know why. And I said, I feel so grateful for it, but I also feel so guilty for it. And then the voice said, that's why. And I just started bawling again. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was like, and I'm not saying this frame, this lens of the world is a reality that is for everybody. It's a construct that 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 works for me. Is like, have you ever seen the movie Green Mile? I haven't yet. Oh, okay. I know, that's on my that list. I, really, that I would sometime. love to. I really would. <laughs> it's, a, the, it's a great movie. And the premise of the movie, just a quick, is like this guy who kind of has his healing powers and he's on death row. Mm. And he was trying to save these two girls and they thought he actually killed them, but he didn't. He was trying to save them. So he has these healing powers, but as a result of this sort of healing powers, he feels the pain of the world. Mm. You know, like, and there's this scene where he talks about, I mean, it's amazing. And I was thinking about this scene and it was like, the guilt I feel, the suffering I go through, the the not just what I've been blessed to experience, but what I continue to seek. As you know, I'm pushing into some pretty intense spaces of suffering. It's not that my suffering or my holding on to pain is going to make the suffering of the world go away, mm -hmm. but it allow it it gives me wisdom to help others through the darkness that I would not have unless I unless I've had this depth of life experience has given me a depth of wisdom that I would not have had. And by continuing to push so far out under these edges, I get a level of wisdom to help other people navigate their own suffering that I would not by just reading a book or something, right? Like I, I'm blessed to experience those. And to me, again, not to say this is a construct that, because uh, many people disagree with me on this construct, to be very clear, is that I believe the suffering that I, I, I continue to seek out and experience is me earning my life. Mm. And it's a debt I owe for the life I've been gifted. Mm. And to be very clear, this doesn't mean I'm constantly like miserable or upset anymore. I love life. And I know what it's like not to. Like when I went to Iraq, I actually gave away all my stuff because I didn't think I'd come back alive. And mm. naively, admittedly, very naively, I was like, if somebody's going to die out there, it has to be me. You can't control that in war because I, the, the close friend I lost had died right before I went to Iraq. Oh. So when I lost him, I said that I'm going to make sure that if somebody has to die out there, it's me. Very naive at the time. I was a kid, right? But I was like ready to go. Mm. I didn't have any fear about that. Today, I te I'm terrified of dying because I love my life, you know? So it's yeah. not that I'm miserable, but this, um, but it's just a way for me to, in my perspective, to earn this life I've been gifted. Right. And I think I might have completely lost track to where the question <laughs> was, but. <laughs> no, it's beautiful, man. I mean, you, you have a unique way of, of knowing how to navigate the spectrum. And that's, that's a rare. Some people feel that it's kind of one or the other, but yeah. the reality is that a spectrum exists on an end. Absolutely right? It's, it's an end. And so <clears throat> we, I've been kind of having these discussions recently about whether when it is, when it comes to suffering or anxiety or stress or fear, a lot of people use the I am statements and then they state those things. But the reality is, is those are fleeting. And so one can feel suffering, yeah. but stating I am suffering is a very, very different thing. Yeah. And I feel like you do such a good job of embodying the I feel suffering because I know that there's another way. Yeah. And so I'm using this as a tool 
whether this fear, the suffering, this anxiety, yeah. the stress, the people that literally everyone feels every single day at experience. some level, yeah. right? Yeah, it's part of the human experience. Yeah. Absolutely, and it has been for, since the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> um, and there's, and it's a great, it can be a great teacher if we allow it to be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what you've really done a great job of dedicating yourself into. And I feel like, I, I feel blessed that I get to see you showing a sense of empathy to others through that action. Mm -hmm. by saying look like you know you travel the world and you do things that like people would never even think of doing like we were just talking and you're training in 112 degrees putting seven you know like boulders and tires on a sled and training through and it's like i don't think you could even pay me to do that <laughs> and you're doing it like you know while other people are like watching and snapping <laughs> yeah. photos and stuff exactly. be like who's this crazy? Yeah, exactly who's this crazy guy um but you're doing this for like when i see you do this like you're you're doing it because you're showing that look although not everyone is doing that like has to deal with that kind of stuff like maybe their stresses might be traffic at work yeah. or maybe maybe the boss yelled them at that day or you know there are stresses and there's no there's no better or worse there's no yeah. more or less yeah. i mean it literally we all all we can experience is from our human dynamic Absolutely. right uh, and how we experience the world and so uh, I love that you provide a sense of of recognition that we can make a choice, yeah. and, and the true power in it is choice. Absolutely, you know. And to your point, which I love, what you said that it is an end, and these things how people will say like, "I am depressed," "I am sad," instead of saying, "I feel sadness," and it makes it their identity. Yes. And because we've 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 created this duality that exists kind of in the human condition, right? We'll. We'll say like, let's look at, I mean, there's dualities to everything, male, female, light, darkness, life, death, contentment, discontentment, ego, humility. And we often live in this world that demonizes one side of the duality, right? Like yes. if I look at stress and recovery, stress is bad or fear of honor. Fear and nirvana, two seemingly very contradictory ideas, right? Fear is the the bad thing, and nirvana is bliss. Yeah. But to your point, that these these forces coexist as one, and life experiences led me to that. That even in suffering, they can be great bliss. Right. You know, like when I'm dragging tires in 112 degrees. Yes, sometimes I'm absolutely miserable, but it's that that bliss in that in that in that moment of going to war with myself. You know, and 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 part of it it, it starts with combating the very demonization of, of this one side of the duality. Like there are no bad emotions. Mm -hmm. We think sadness, guilt, fear, stress, anxiety are bad emotions. They're not bad. They just are. They're more challenging than let's say joy or anything like that to experience, to, to go through, but they're not bad. And the second you stop demonizing them as bad and you accept them for the isness that they are mm -hmm. is when you can start to kind of find the oneness and the duality like yeah. this fear is there but it's not who i am and it's not bad it just is i can choose to be something beyond this mm -hmm. and who will i choose to be mm -hmm. you know this experience whatever it may be whatever the emotion you know can i i, I can i can because even the search for joy can be a very negative thing i mean when i'm just when i was doing a lot of drugs that's all i wanted to do was feel really good all the damn time you know yeah. so and this is where like the duality comes in again it's like too much of each side is is unhealthy like too much stress yes unhealthy too much recovery not enough stress is also unhealthy you know you need to play on playing on both edges is where you kind of find a oneness on on the spectrum and as you know i play pretty far on both edges <laughs> so so that's allowed me to to experience the the human condition like i mean one of the reasons why i love running ultra marathons or doing these long distance experiences like you know being in antarctica for multiple days and doing these hard expeditions is it becomes a microcosm for the entire human experience right. you know in one 24-hour run i can experience horrifically intense lows but blissful highs right. and you go through this journey you know and that is the human the human experience is an adventure of highs and lows of ups and downs you can't have a summit without a valley but when you start, when you stop demonizing anything as bad, like guilt or any or, or fear or anything, you start to humanize it. You start to accept it. You start to embrace it, and then you can choose who you want to who you want to be outside of it. What, what do you want to do with it in service of your mission, in service of who you are? I love that. It makes so much sense. I mean, it's obviously easier said than done, for 100%. sure. Yeah. But just like anything, when you put effort, intention, and awareness, and most of all, practice, yeah, then it can be. And so what I love is if you were to say an I am statement, I am choice might be the most apt 
Mm, I like that. Yeah. Because that is literally what we're doing in every now moment. Yeah. Because we have the, like, to me, that's my, like, I identify choice as our opportunity for our divine creator within ourselves in action. Yeah. And like, that's what I feel like we're blessed with every single moment. Like yeah. when they call it the present moment, yes, I mean, it's a gift and we've heard all these beautiful words surrounding that. Yeah. And totally agree with them. They are. But, but when you like draw it really, really down I mean the choice yeah if we don't like where we're going or if we are fearing feeling fear or we're feeling stressed or if we're feeling joy or you know in mean, any of these emotions that are in in essence temporary to help yeah. us inform us of our journey you know choices is, is what can be the constant absolutely and i love that you do such a good job in the way that you approach life in in helping people understand that and recognize that so yeah. thank you for that, Absolutely. For that and your dedication to that. Thank you. Thank you for the acknowledgement. I love what you said about choice and I couldn't agree with you more. Like, and to your point that it's easier said than done, I 100% agree. And one way to sort of make that practical, like, and I actually wrote this, this came to me in the darkness when I was, I was journaling in the dark, you know? And uh, one of the things that came to me was there's sort of, the way I look at it is there's two selves, there's two eyes, okay? And you can use whatever version you want, the divine self and normal self. Like what came to me in the dark, and this was just free flowing, kind of in, in journal was there was a more a, what I call a mortal self and the immortal self. Okay. And the distinction between the two is how I separate myself from my emotion and make that choice. So the mortal self will be like, okay, I'm feeling fear. And as you know, these thoughts and feelings can feel so real. Mm. They can feel like this is who I am in this moment. Right. Yeah. But as we we're just talking about, that's not who you are. They're fleeting. They're going to go up and down and you're not defined by that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you are that choice. So the immortal self is the per is the higher self, the divine self that when you talked about bringing the, the God, the divinity within to transcend that and be something more. Mm -hmm. And this is why I like playing on the edge when I'm out there, dude, right now training for what I'm training for, which, you know, the 110 day expedition across Antarctica, I am constantly in fear. There is not a day that goes, maybe a day if I'm really busy with work, but I would say for the most part, not a day that goes by where I don't feel a <clears throat> tremendous amount of fear about what awaits me out there. Yeah. And so one self can feel it, but the other self can can acknowledge its beauty. Like that fear is beautiful. Fear kills complacency. You know, in Iraq, we always used to say complacency kills and fear prevents that because my fear is like, you better get your ass out the door and train, right? Or whatever it may be. So. The, the, the divine self, the immortal self can look at this thing, this emotion, this thought and say, it's there. Who do I want to be outside of it? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, you mentioned earlier, I was very blessed when I got the endorsement from the Dalai Lama. When I reached out to him, it took five months of building a relationship with this monk there. The whole time I wasn't getting an email back. I was like, who am I? They probably hate me. What if they think my book is stupid? All this stuff we go on in our head, right? That story that we have. Right. And in the moment, it can feel so real. No, it's true. It's not just a thought. It's true, right? Yeah. But I can feel it. Acknowledge it's there. All right, hey, cool. I got you. You're there. This mortal self is having this thought, but I'm not going to be defined by it. So I'd follow up anyway, take action anyway, move forward anyway, right? Yeah. And still to this day, this thought can be there, but it's not going to define my reality. And that, to your point, it comes with practice. A simple, very simple tool is simply like labeling the emotion. Mm -hmm. I feel fear. I feel anger. Neuro neuroscience actually shown when you label an emotion, it reduces activity in the part of your in the emotional parts of your brain, the limbic system, and increases activity in the part of your brain related to focus and awareness, the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So it simply labeling it creates the space. And you can say, okay, I feel fear. Like instead of saying I am depressed, you could say my brain goes to a state of depression from time to time, but I am not my brain, and my brain is not me. This is not who I am. Mm -hmm. And a very simple tool that I do all the time is talking out loud to myself. Nice. Yeah, I mean, if I, if somebody was like filming me while I was training, I look like a crazy person. Well, it's cool. Uh, I call it a staff <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. Exactly. Because when you talk out loud, you're bringing focus to that. Yeah. It's not this chaotic stuff running around in here, right? Like now I'm bringing so because then my 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 it's like a choice I'm making to speak these words into reality. Yeah. And the words I speak in reality are coming from that immortal self that I'm like my highest self. That's who is going to speak right now, and that will shut down the other stuff if need be you know and yeah. i do this a lot when i'm training because i'll be going through moments where just like this sucks and you're feeling like moments of self-pity maybe and then i will talk out loud to myself to to awaken that warrior to keep fighting to keep moving the next step forward you know i love it i thank you for sharing that too i feel like that could really help a lot of people and so. and i feel like you know, as an only child like you know i I talked a lot to myself and that's why I was making that joke yeah. about it. But, but like, it, it's really helpful because it's so easy to have a thought in your head 
but it's another set of intention to actually say it out loud. Exactly. And then when you hear it out loud, that's a whole other thing because exactly. you may not actually agree with what you say, which is okay. It's a real lot to say something and yeah. not agree with it. And, yeah, you know, and be like, wow, you know, maybe I had this thought, but it's not, now yeah. that I hear it, it's like, <laughs> do I, you know, and that's a good, it's good to question. Exactly. It's good to, to understand ourselves. And that's again, back to this choice. I mean, the beauty of the present moment is we get an opportunity to learn about who we are in every now moment. Yeah. Like we get to choose differently. Yeah. Or if we really like who that's who we are and that's who we want to, you know, bring more permanence into that I am or that yeah. isness, yeah. then we get to choose that and we get the opportunity to continue to choose it as the world around us is like, hey, are you sure you want to be? <laughs> are you sure you want to be more empathetic to yourself? Because here's more suffering. Or, yeah. you know, are you sure you want to be patient? Because you know, this is going to yeah. be difficult. It's gonna test you. Yeah. yeah. And 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 those tests or those opportunities are presented to us so that we can continue to choose that so we can know ourselves in that way yeah and the more that we choose it the more it becomes first nature yeah, it becomes, becomes the, just exactly. who we are and exactly. then those moments that we kind of lull in whether it's depression or anxiety or fear we recognize that you know maybe where it might have taken us a couple of days or even a week to kind of stay in that in order to get ourselves out you know that can dwindle it can be it can turn into a matter of you know just one day or a couple hours or down to even a couple minutes or even a few seconds 100%. when we fully understand and practice like who we are inside yeah. and we have that conviction of like look this is this is an experience, but I know who I am and I yeah. trust in who I am and I trust in my journey. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that comes with practice and that's the, to, to, to normalize that, man. There was a point in my life where I'd be drinking a 750 milliliter bottle of vodka a day. I would be drinking, throwing up. As soon as I'm done throwing up, pick up the bottle again. Like my body's rejecting this poison and I'm still drinking. Like that was my low. Today, and I really try to stress this point because sometimes people see the things they do and think, Oh, he's unique and special. Like it's not that at all. Mm -hmm. Far from it, you know. But today, like the low, like we were just talking earlier, you know, when I was in Iceland doing a training expedition, uh, I had it was had seven big rocks in my sled. Was dragging this heavy sled up a hill in slushy snow. After about ten hours of the day, I looked at my GPS and I thought I was maybe, you know, twenty minutes from camp. My GPS showed I still had about two hours left to go, and I had this moment of just dejection, like. <laughs> Not this, I don't want to be here, this sucks. But it was like maybe 30 seconds, you yeah. know? And then I was like, stop feeling sorry for yourself. This is why you are here, you yeah. know? That's the, the one of the strongest tools to navigate suffering, and this comes with training, yeah. is like sort of step one is, okay, not demonizing it. This is okay, I'm, I'm feeling it, right? Like one of my mantras, I use mantras a lot, is be with what is, but do not become what is. Mm. This actually came to me on a run. I was going through a long, I don't know, one of my many ultra marathons, and I was feeling pain, as you do. And I was like, all right, be with the pain, but do not become the pain. You know, mm. be with it. And so, okay, be with this. It's, it's sort of step one. And step two is you embrace it. This is not like I accept it, now I'm embracing it. This is, there's something here. And then step three is kind of you seek it. Like I'm now when I go out in these arenas, like, and I still am human. So I'll have still moments where I kind of hate it for a second, but then I remind myself, like, this is why you are here. Mm. If you weren't trying, like if you didn't, if you want it easy, I remember once I, would, I did an 80 mile run around this 0.2 mile loop. And while I was training for it, I remember thinking, oh, I hope it's not too hard. And then I was like, if you wanted it to be easy, why in God's name would you run 80 miles around a 0.2 mile loop? <laughs> so what are you talking about? This is again my self-talk, right? Like, shut up. Like this is, it's going to be. And so now you seek the suffering and now you, when it comes you are able to face it with love, face it with joy, face it. Because mm. look, we're going to experience it whether you seek it or not, you know? And so when you, when you train yourself to smile in the face of it, to like to suffer well, mm -hmm. my core mantra, you can handle life whether it punches you in the face or whether you're pursuing your worthy challenge, whatever the challenge may be. Mm -hmm. Any worthy path is going to be hard. Raising kids, playing a guitar, skiing across Antarctica, whatever it may be, it will be hard. But if you embrace the suffering of it and you fall in love with it and you start by everything we've talked about before, right? You don't define yourself with it. You don't identify with it. It's just there. But it doesn't mean that's who you are. And so I went from like this guy drinking, you know, 750 milliliters of vodka a day to 30 seconds of feeling a low moment and being like, all right, stop feeling sorry and let's keep moving forward. Kept moving forward in a 12-hour day. Next hour, next day woke up in another nine-hour day. That comes with time. Like I, I wasn't born this way, you know. Yeah. I built it, and any and anybody with with stepping into that arena over and over again will can build that self as well. Love that, and there's just so much truth in that. And I, and what I love about what you're saying is that 
even though the, the brand, and I'd love to dive into Fearvana a little bit so people can get some some context and, and have a, a deeper understanding, not just of the book, but just what it what it's become, um, the movement for for a, a stronger word, I feel. Um, but what I feel like when I first got to know you and you started sharing about fear and stress and suffering, and I was like, it's like, man, I don't really connect with that. Like, I feel like there's other ways to do this. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, and that's something like, I mean, and the reality is, is like a lot of the major religions of the world started in fear and suffering and these kind of things and, and, and finding a journey on a way to, yeah. to, so it's not like that's out of the norm. To me, it's, it's not even that a crazy thing by any yeah. means. I mean, as you said, we all experience it in some level. Um, but what I love, and, and as we got to talk to each other and really understand like where the depth of this is coming from, is that you do you do see it as love. Is that love is is like you're breathing love into into this. Mm -hmm. And so when I when I do hear you say that you have trouble with self empathy, part of it like my heart breaks a little bit because the reality is is I'm seeing you provide self empathy through the actions you're taking. Like the reality is you're breathing love to yourself. It's not a lack of worthiness by yeah. any means because you are stepping in just as you would. Like, like if I was suffering, I could count on you to step in and, and talk me and walk me through it. So that's hard enough to do for someone else effectively. But you're taking it to the next level and you're doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you've gotten so good at it that you can do it in a matter of seconds. To me, that is self-empathy. That is not a lack of worthiness. That is a full yeah, understanding true. of self yeah. at the deepest, deepest level and recognizing like I love myself enough yeah. that I'm willing to be a best friend for me. So I love what you said and I and it and it moves me and it meant a lot. And I do think I've evolved over the years, like where I've struggled more mm -hmm. with that, that I do now. Like I said, you know, today I'm terrified of death. I'm terrified. I, I love my life. I love myself. Yeah. And I think this is where like when when you do these hard things, there's you know, when we were talking about this before, the empathy itself, I was thinking a lot about it. Like it this is coming back to the sort of the two self, because there's a time where you have to push yourself hard when you're in that space like and and sometimes that means i get in sort of very military mode talking to myself like suck it the fuck up get your ass out the door whatever you got to say to yourself right but even then that can so this is coming back to that concept of the two selves like the immortal self can talk you you have to know how to it's like it's like this imagine if i was like you were in the suffering and i need to help you and let's say it was like a survival situation sometimes i might need to like slap you in the face maybe literally or figuratively to be like all right you need to man up and get up right now yeah. other times you'd be like dude hey i got you like i'm here so the way you handle somebody in a, in a tense situation is going to be dependent sometimes you need to show love and like just being compassionate sometimes you need to like have them just get up and wake up because survival depends on it right. and that's kind of how i treat myself and you have to know yourself enough how to navigate that so the immortal self has pure love for who, like, I, I love who I am today. I wasn't always there. That's what I was talking about earlier, how I struggled with that. And I'm not saying guilt doesn't show up from time to time. It does. Uh, that survivor's guilt, the guilt about that. But but again, guilt is not a bad emotion. No. Like for a long time, for example, I've had a picture of my friend that I lost in the war up on my wall. And it said, this should have been you. Earn this life. Wow. It was an intense thing to look at. And I, today I, I no longer have it up because it, like anything, it can go too far. And it was like too much. It got to a point, but for a while it fueled me. And to this day, sometimes like I'll watch a scene from a war movie, knowing it'll make me cry. Mm. Like just the other day, I watched the scene from Hacksaw Ridge and bawling. Right. Mm. But I like there's there's value to the intensity of that emotion. You know, there's sadness has its place. Pain has its place. You know, it teaches you something. You don't want to like. I want to feel the range of that. I've been moments after Iraq where I just felt numb to all life, to all emotions. And that is not healthy. It's not a good way to live, you know? So point is to say now I do love myself and that immortal self, and this comes with practice, knows how to navigate the other self. Sometimes I got to talk to myself hard and mm -hmm. just be like, dude, you need to suck it up and get your, you know, take that next step. Sometimes be like, all right, brother, like, love you. We got this. And you, sh and you, you navigate with both those. This is where you're playing on that spectrum again, right? Yes. Of hardness and soft being like hard and soft. Is that another duality you, you, but that again comes with experience of knowing how to talk to yourself. But the more you do it, the more you start to recognize that even your darkest demons can become your greatest allies. Yes. And this is a hard thing to fathom at first because those demons are the places we don't want to go, mm -hmm. right? Like Carl Jung said, people will do anything no matter how absurd to avoid confronting their own soul. 
And often it's not because we're scared of the light, we're scared of the dark. You know, but when you, I'll give you an example. When I was did that uh, run across Liberia, it was like day four. I had this aching pain in my shin just hit. I was about 17 miles in for the run of the day. Aching pain hit. And I don't know what it was. I stopped trying to massage. It wasn't going away. So I started limping and walking and I was battling not just the physical pain, but the psychological pain of like, I got three more days of running. How am I going to do this? You know? And then I started sprinting, like all out sprinting. And the whole time I was saying things to myself, remember Neil, that should have been you who died in the war instead of him earn this life. People are suffering. I was in Liberia. This country has gone through civil war, Ebola, poverty. And I was like seeing all the suffering around you. Like these people are suffering around you. If you quit now, you deserve a coward's death and, and like, you know, suck it up. You have to earn this shit. Like this very like dark, intense stuff to myself. But that five miles that I ran to finish that day's mileage was the fastest five miles I ran the entire trip. Mm. So in that moment, my demons became my allies. Mm. And I didn't talk to myself like that the entire trip. A lot of other times it was just bliss at like beauty of everything i was experiencing beauty of myself a privilege that i get to experience this love like i love i, I mean i celebrate myself often like dude you went out there and to drag tires for hours and 114 days like we're a warrior you know you acknowledge yourself mm -hmm. you celebrate that wins and i think that part is also so important in the building of your self-identity because i think we, we all have wins every day but very often we don't stop to acknowledge those wins yeah. And when you do stop to acknowledge those wins, no matter how small, I'm not saying like you, you go over the top on a small win, like I'm not a big believer in participation trophies kind of thing, but <laughs> but you at least like uh, nice work and then yeah. you, you kind of reward yourself. And that's 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 reinforcing this identity that this is who, to your point, how you were saying earlier, right? Like if you practice this enough, this is who you become. Mm -hmm. But that happens by rewarding yourself enough. It's almost like giving a treat to a dog, right? Like when you train a dog, he give a treat, he knows to do this behavior. In the same way, you're kind of like tricking your brain. You know, I'll sort of put dopamine in my brain by rewarding myself intrinsically. Mm -hmm. And it's teaching myself that this is who I want to be. So that love is now there. And it's just through practice, I learn how to, I'm not perfect at it, but I'm way better than I used to be at how to talk to oneself whether I need to be hard or whether I need to be soft. With others, it's a different animal because you need to learn enough about the person if you're going to help guide. Like if you do that with the, the if you if you're doing it with somebody else and you're hard when they need soft, yeah. you can it can be damaging. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you need to be hard. And, and but you have to know the person enough to guide them in that right way. If that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. I mean, that's and I appreciate you talking about the acknowledgement because that's a huge part to me. That is self empathy. Right. Yeah. That's compassion for self. That's yeah. recognizing yourself that is love that's showing Absolutely. like hey <clears throat> you know you're not constantly beating yourself down yeah and that's you're so, showing the wins and, yeah and many people it's so easy to com you know to compliment someone else and on their wins yeah. and all that but but yeah. when it comes to yourself yeah so if something so simple like that i mean again we when you hear it like oh yeah like obviously but it's another thing to put into practice 100 because we also demonize ego Right. Ego is demonized bad. Ego is not inherently bad. Like in, if, if I want to be great, I have to believe in my own greatness. I have nice. to talk, like when I talk to myself, it's if I talk to myself in the mirror, like it's other people watching me might think I'm egotistical, yeah. but it's not that. It's just, I have to own my own greatness to do the kind of things that I'm doing. Right. And so that's where, that's where it's important to, I've, I've been in seminars where they'll do this a bra a bragging exercise where let's say you and me are a pair for two minutes. We let just brag how awesome we are. Yeah. And some people get horrifically uncomfortable about it. Like just so like, I can't do it. And, and you can see because, and inevitably they don't have that love for how awesome they are. Like we've all, anybody watching this, you and me, we've gone through hard times in life. Yeah. You wouldn't be here if you had overcome that struggle, but not often are we celebrating that, you know? And I was at a time to your point about self empathy where I would run 10 miles and be pissed off. I didn't run 12. I'd run 12. I'd be angry. I didn't run 20. If I ran 20, I'd be angry. I'd, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. And that's just a miserable way to live, man. It is. You know? And so now like I'll acknowledge the wins that, all right, good job. You did this, you know, and I'm still looking, where can I improve? But I'm loving myself for at least what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know? And I think pausing that, and that comes with practice, recognizing that ego and humility, two sides of a duality, it's not a one or the other. It's a both and can coexist. You know, exactly. and both those should go, must coexist. That's how you find a greater sense of that inner peace. Yeah. Do you feel that because our society is so focused on duality that there's um, a disconnect on the coexistence of it? Like, you know, it's like it has to be one or the other. Yeah. And the disconnect is in, in the understanding of how balance fits into it. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I do think that, I mean, that's why mm -hmm. in Eastern religions like Buddhism, you'll see a lot of like books on non-duality, non-dualism, oneness. Right. So you see a little bit more of that. And sometimes there's sort of the Eastern philosophies and Eastern religion. But I think our world has become more 
separated, creating separation instead of oneness. Mm. And I mean, there's a, we could spend an hour talking about examples of that, but, <laughs> but I think that, yes. I think that like playing when, when you step out into the arena, like a good way to make this very actionable. Like one thing I do is I will always look for what duality is causing me the most friction and play on the other end of that duality. So for example, when I was sharing with you about how I was like always just angry at myself, like I'm running 10 miles, angry at run 12, whatever, right? I was very, very good at suffering, but I noticed that I was bringing like suffering in every context of my life, even just day to day, I was miserable, yeah. you know? And I was like, all right, if I look at this from a duality, suffering and play, and again, semantics aside, use whatever word you want. Sure. Let me go on the other side. So like as an example, when I was in this phase of my life, I remember once seeing a sign that said 5K fun run and there was visceral disgust, not even emotion, like not even a conscious <laughs> choice. It was like subconscious disgust at the idea of a fun run. You don't run for fun. You run to suffer. That's the only reason you should be run running. And that's absurd, right? Like that was absurd. It was not healthy. And so I was like, all right, now let me go play in this side. Let me do lighter things. Let me be playful. Let me have, let me take, go for a run where I'm not measuring my distance and just having fun, however much it is, mm -hmm. listening to me, whatever I need to do, right? And by playing on the other edge of this duality, now, of course, if you, if you lay that on a spectrum, I will always be someone who leans towards the suffering side, considering what I do. But now it's a choice. It's not just the subconscious forces controlling me. I've gone to the other edge and I'm playing on it. And that's how you find oneness. That's how you find where you lie on it. That's why you, that's also how you find the dualities can coexist. Like I can go, I can be suffering on a hard tire drag and still be playful and have a sense of humor about it. And often I do, but that wouldn't be, that wasn't me a long time ago, you know? So when I, before I went to the darkness, my duality was control and surrender, you know? So that was a duality I was playing with because I'm a giant control freak. My world is my hands. I will control it. Now in the darkness, you surrender to the mysticism of the universe, like that conversation with God, yeah. you know? And so I'm always looking for a duality to play with and to, to, to experience the other edge. And that's how you start to see how they can coexist and how they can, can, can kind of find oneness in that. I love that. So, so duality is more of a barometer for you uh, on the spectrum of coexistence. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of what I, I know we've had these conversations about like, you know, we hear hot and cold, right? But, you know, sometimes scientists will say, well, is there really cold? Is it just hot and less hot? And less hot, yeah. You know, and so yeah. when we talk about love, you know, what an opportunity to see that coexistence spectrum and recognizing yeah. that, hey, it's all love. Because you can, you can have love without fear and, and all that. But it's, I don't, I, I don't know if you can have fear without love because you know usually what you love or, or something love is a, a part of it in some way whether it's yourself agree. or yeah. someone else or something else yeah. like it's that and so in the end it is all love and i was having yeah. a conversation with someone who's really struggling with um <clears throat> well like you know okay that's great if i'm if i'm not if i'm not depressed or i'm not fear or i'm not you know all these things that I'm, those are actually feelings okay that's great but how can I just be loving all the time? Like, you know, that doesn't even make sense. Like that doesn't register. And so kind of Amber and I were kind of chatting through it and we're like, mm. we're not asking you to like, the, the question is not about the doing. If, if love is the base, then that's what we all are. Mm. So all we're doing is saying, be what you already are. Mm. And and the the fear and the stress or the joy or any on anything on that spectrum is an experience of love. So you're never you're never not love mm. is the true reality so, of it. Yeah. You know that's that's the beauty of the coexistence yeah. and and that's the beauty of recognizing this as a spectrum. And so when you're taking this as a tool for a barometer to say, okay, well, if I'm always going to be on the spectrum, which is you know the as as you place it, the immortal self is yeah. kind of that spectrum. Then the mortal self is kind of playing yeah. in that spectrum to understand itself. Yeah. And so I I can I can like I am love. Like that's that's yeah. what I feel at the very core, yeah. uh, both immortal and mortal. Yeah. But I still feel emotion. I still feel joy, and I feel sadness, and yeah. like because like we were talking about in the beginning of this uh, month, Amber and I were sharing. Well, so many people talk about, you know, feeling empathy in, in this focus is fully on suffering. Well, what if I want to have empathy for your joy? Yeah. What if I want to have empathy for your bliss? Yeah. Like, why can't I meet you there? Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing. It's just a frequency. It's Absolutely. as you said, it's just a choice. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. And I think to that point, you know, I've always like, I always say that fear is not the enemy of love. Fear is an expression of love. 
to your point of how fear can, and I think it's sometimes framed as the opposite, but by doing that, we deem, I've often heard sometimes we'll say love, there's only two ways of being love and fear, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's an opposite to your point. I think love is the base. I mean, like I said, there was a point where I was not scared of dying because I didn't love my life. Yeah. Today I am scared of dying and I love my life, you know? Why are we scared of losing someone? Because we love them. Like that, that, and we, when you start seeing, like there was somebody I was working with who was terrified of public speaking. He mm. was trying to eliminate the fear and fight it. And I said, why are you scared? And he was like, I got this message. And, and I was like, you're scared because you love your message and you love the people you want to talk to. Right. And suddenly by reframing the fear as that expression of love, mm. it altered. I'm not saying that means the fear goes away, mm. but it changes how you relate to it. And it doesn't need to yes. go away. I mean, dude, I do the most insane things in the world, as you know, <laughs> and I would be scared at like the most minute things. Like the other day I was messaging a girl on a dating app. I was having more butterflies in my stomach and anxiety and fear than like staring into a polar storm in Antarctica where I've lost fingers, you know, like, <laughs> and my friends are like, dude, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like it's, but so the thing is like now, and there was a time where I would be like, if I felt fear, I'd, I would talk to myself like man up, you know, like stop, like you should do, stop being afraid. Now I don't care when it's there. Like let be there. Cool. Hey, you, 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 like you be there. It's okay that you're there. It's okay that this fear is there. But I don't have to. I don't have to let it define my actions. I can choose outside of it. I can choose with it. I can choose like the, when when you channel fear. As I said, fear kills complacency. Fear is profound in the like. I want to be scared of what I'm about to do in Antarctica. If I wasn't scared, that'd be a problem. Right. <laughs> there would be something wrong if I wasn't scared. You know. So whenever it shows up, even if it's the most seemingly mundane thing or the most extreme thing where I could die, let it be there. I don't care when it's there. I just accept it and use it. You know. Mm -hmm. I love that. I mean. That understanding, and for people, everyone listening and watching today, like for reference, like you're about to go a year from now uh, in your training for a, a solo trip to Antarctica, something that literally no human, at least recorded history, has ever done before. No, so yeah, and, yeah, it'll and be, so it'll be 110 days wow. completely alone, dragging a two, about a 400 pound sled for 2,750 kilometers, 1,700 miles across the entire continent of Antarctica and uh, dragging that sled for 10 to 12 hours a day and, and temperatures, you know, minus 40 degrees below. I mean, I was in Antarctica last year and I lost a finger to frostbite. So it's one of the most unforgiving, hostile, and I mean, talking about suffering. So yeah, that's, that's hence the tire dragging and all that is all training and leading up to this, this big, big journey mm -hmm. that, like I said, leaves me with fear every day. But I mean, why, so why, like, why would it do that? It scares me. It's so much suffering because to your expression, to that point about love, like, in that depth of silence, in that depth of struggle, like when, when, why I do these things is it's not the suffering in and of, in and of itself that draws me. Mm -hmm. The suffering is the means, but it's not the purpose. Right. The purpose is the transcendence. When you find something within yourself to transcend that suffering, that to me is an experience of God. Mm -hmm. And when you're completely alone out there in the silence, you know, you hear things that you won't hear in the distraction of the world. You will hear your voice. You'll tap into your own divinity, whatever our own version. We all have our own version of God, what God means. You see that, you experience that in a, in a different way. And that transcendence is the draw, you know? Mm. And it's like, the, it, it's like, you know, if you get the analogy, it's like to, to find a treasure, you got to battle the dragon to find the treasure, right? And every treasure hunting, they got to battle something to find the treasure. The suffering that I go through is a necessary vehicle to, to get to that treasure. And that treasure, I mean... It is God. It's divine. It's the, it's hard to put into words that transcendence you experience. That's that's the draw. To I love me. it, man. I mean, I can feel, I can feel, I can see your passion, your heart, and your soul through this. And so, of course, I'm scared for you as your brother and someone who loves you. And and you know that's, you know, but but I see, I see the, I see it pulling the best out of you. And like. Yeah what else can we ask for our loved ones than that which pulls the best out of them? It's beautiful. Yeah. And kind of with that said, like, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, you know, Amber and I, like we absolutely, you know, that's why you're here right now. And many, many reasons is we see you as a heart leader because you, you bring so much, as I was saying, you, you breathe love, you, you exude, you embody love in, into what you do through action. So like when you hear the term heart leader, like what does that kind of invoke in you? Mm. You know, I'll uh, I'll answer it with wiser uh, with the words from a wiser man than myself. So Carl Jung, who I quote a lot, he said, "Know the theories, master the techniques, but when you meet a human soul, just be a human soul." Hmm. 
And I think that to me beautifully summarizes what a heart leader is, because if you put those two words, right, a leader, I think if you're a leader in any context, whether it's leading Marines in a combat environment, a leader in the world, whatever the context, it's your responsibility Mm -hmm. to lead your troops literally or figuratively. Uh, And that means like to the point, know the theories, master the techniques. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to put in the work, to be that leader, to be on the front lines, to not, not, you're not, you're not creating an army of followers, you're creating an army of other leaders, right? To cultivate leaders, you have to, like, imagine if I'm talking about fear and embracing suffering and I'm sitting on a couch, like not doing anything every day, <laughs> not exactly going to fit with my, with my brand messaging, right? So it, you have to lead from the front. And I believe me, I've experienced leaders who don't, they'll tell you to go do things and they won't go do it, you know? So leading from the front, embodying that. And then the hard part is that like you're leading with human soul, with the love for humanity, a love for yourself, of course, but that deeper depth and, and of, of coming from a place of empathy for who, who, who you are. Like we were talking earlier about sometimes you have to lead, like even in leading Marines, sometimes you got to be hard on them. Other times you got to hear them out because they're going through some hard times. Yeah. And that's your job as a leader is to know that on your, know when to do which, when to, you know, whatever the context again may be, it's to know that, but to, to give, to, to put yourself on the line for your, for the people you serve. And that's one of the one of the core things I love about the Marines was it taught me you live for the good of the group. The Marines nobody cares about your well being. What matters is the men and the mission. They are more important than you. The group is more important than you. And it was something profoundly beautiful about living in that institution, you know? Mm. And so that to me is a heart leader is is mastery, pursuing mastery of whatever the craft is mm. and coming from that place of the human soul, coming from love of the human soul. And another Carl Jung quote to kind of put a ribbon on this, he said, you know, if anyone wants to know anything about the human psyche, it would be best to abandon scholar's gown, put down his textbooks, and wander with human heart through the world. Mm. There he would reap richer stores of knowledge than textbooks a foot they could give him, and he would know how to doctor the sick with the true knowledge of the human soul. Yeah, it, Carl Jung is like, touches my soul. And I think that is it. Like, when you to, to kind of, I guess, put a ribbon on it from where we started is having played on these playgrounds I've got to play in. You see the human soul and it's, and a heart leader is coming from that love of the human soul, from the depth of human compassion and human understanding mm-hmm. and seeing that this is not another being than me. It is me. We are one in this and I will treat this person. I will treat this hum- human soul as my own soul. Mm. You know, I love that, man. That's a beautiful, <laughs> man. You, I mean, sometimes there's not even words right now, but, um, you do such an incredible job of meeting people where they're at through that compassion, through that empathy, but also pulling the best out of yourself. And it's this beautiful cycle that you create through that process. And I feel like that's such a, such a great opportunity for so many of us to learn from you in that way. So thank you for all that you do and all that you are, all that you represent. It's just, uh, it's a, it's a gift to, to be able to call you a brother. Likewise, my brother. I appreciate you. Yeah, Thank you. And this time goes by so fast. Man. I mean, I feel like I could talk <laughs> oh, for right? hours with you, but um, hopefully this will be one of, of many more conversations to come. Absolutely. It'd be an honor to have you back. Absolutely. It would truly be an honor. appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, man. And, um, for all those listening, thank you so much for tuning in today. And so I'd, briefly, I would love, uh, for all those who want to connect with Akshay, Akshay has some incredible, his book, uh, and his programs, his coaching, his speaking, he does so, so much. Can you kind of sure. just kind of dive in and just share with people where they can connect with you, how they can connect with you and, uh, to follow you on your journey yeah, and uh, sure. be inspired by, <laughs> by you. So I share a lot of the journey and the lessons from the journey. Instagram is the primary social media platform I use. It's, uh, at fearvana, F E A R V A N A. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at fearvana, my website, fearvana. I also have some training on there. If like, it's like 25 ways to navigate the pain cave. So 25 different strategies. We've touched on a few today, yeah. but different strategies on navigating pain. So, and, and whatever form it shows up, physical, mental, or spiritual. Um, and so that's on fearvana.com. And as you mentioned, the book is available on Amazon and Kindle, Audible, and paperback. And 100% of the profit, profits in the book go to charity. We've uh, supported survivors of sex trafficking to former mm-hmm. child soldiers. And so all the book profits go to helping people who are who don't have the luxury like I do, like we do to choose our own path. And who are in some of those darkest corners of the globe. So it's beautiful. And we'll be sure to have all of those links, everything you just shared in the description below. And um, brother, thank you 
so much for your time today. Likewise, brother. And thank you, everyone. Uh, so much love. And uh, again, this month is all about empathy. So be sure to check out our empathy training toolkit. It's free. You can download it. And it's part of the Heart Leader Toolbox as well, which has just tons of amazing uh, guidebooks and exercises for you to dive into the different themes every month. And we just appreciate you. And we love you so much. Thank you for all your support. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one.